Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first keynote session of Python APEC 2022. I'm the host, and my name is Jiahua. Our speaker is Dustin Ingram. Dustin is a software engineer on Google's open source security team, where he works on improving the security of open source software that Google and the rest of the world relies on. He's also a director of the Python Software Foundation, where he helps ensure the long-term success of one very big open source Python project you've probably heard of, Python itself. As well as the community around it, he's also maintainer of the Python pa package index, where he helps ensure the long-term success of hundreds of thousands of tiny Python projects, many of which you, you are probably never heard of, but play a critical role in the Python ecosystem. The topic he is talking about is protecting the collective good. Without any further delay, please welcome our keynote speaker, Dustin. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, like he said, I'm Dustin, and this talk is about protecting the collective good. Um, I am a director of the Python Software Foundation, and what that means is I'm on the board of directors of the PSF. And the PSF is the organization behind Python, the language, and many of the other projects uh, around Python. And our goal as directors on this board is to help guide the language, help make sure that it continues to exist for a long time. Um, like you said, I'm also a maintainer of the Python package index, and I've been that for a while as well, uh, longer than I've been on the board, in fact. And so I really care a lot about software security and you know distributing Python code for quite a while. And more recently, I am I have recently joined the Google Open Source Security team. Um, like you said, the mission of the team is to improve the security of open source software that that Google and the entire world, in fact, relies upon. So we are an externally facing team trying to solve problems uh, in open source software security. And we're working on a lot of projects in a lot of different areas. Um, I'll be excited to talk to you about some of those in a little bit. First, a disclaimer, though. Um, the opinions that I'm expressing here in this talk are solely my own. They don't express the views or opinions of my employer, any of the projects I work on, my team, or of the Python Software Foundation itself. And I want to give a little forward, a little intro to what this talk is about. This talk is about protecting the collective good. We are builders. As developers, as programmers, we are really good at building things. We have a near infinite amount of tools and raw material at our disposal. And usually these tools and raw material are provided to us for free. I think that sometimes we tend to get caught up in the building because building things is fun and because as engineers, we are good at it. Sometimes I think we don't stop often enough and ask ourselves, what are we building? Why are we building it? What outcome are we hoping to achieve with what we build? And maybe what outcome is someone else hoping to achieve with what we build? So in this talk, I'll explain what I mean by the collective good and why I think it needs to be protected. I'll talk a little bit about what we're building, what our community is building, what my team is building, and so on, and a little bit about why we're building as well, and why I think it's really important to reflect on what we're building, why we're building it, but also how you as an individual can help. First, I want to tell you all a story. And this is a true story about two very similar women who traveled two very different paths. This is Gertrude Jung. She was born in Munich, Germany in 1920. When she was 15, she joined the Bund Deutscher Model, the League of German Girls. She was a dancer and she wanted to be a ballerina in Berlin. But by 1941, at the start of the Second World War, it prevented her from joining a dance school, so instead she trained to be a secretary. This is Sophia Scholl. 
She was born in Fortenberg, Germany, which is about 300 kilometers from Munich in 1921. At the age of 12, like Gertrude, she also chose to join the BDM. She had a talent for drawing and for painting, and in 1940, she graduated from secondary school and became a kindergarten teacher. After finishing training to be a secretary in 1942, at the age of 22, Gertraud heard about a job opening for a secretary at the government office of the Chancellor of Germany, applied for it, and got the job. That same year, Sophie Scholl enrolled in the University of Munich, and later that year, after becoming increasingly disillusioned with the Nazi regime, she and her brother Hans and several other students founded the White Rose, which was a nonviolent underground resistance group. The members adopted a strategy of passive resistance against Nazi policies and regime, writing and distributing leaflets, which called on the German people to take action to stop the injustice and genocide happening in their country. In 1943, Gertrude is given the opportunity to transfer to Hitler's headquarters and began working directly for him as one of his private secretaries. And despite being so close to the Nazi leader, she has little to no idea about what the regime is doing. She later said, I was 22 and I didn't know about anything about politics. It didn't interest me. On February 18th, 1943, Sophie and her brother Hans were arrested by the Gestapo while distributing flyers at the Ludwig Maximilian University. In her defense in court four days later, Sophie said, Somebody, after all, had to make a start. What we wrote and said is also believed by many others. They just don't dare express themselves as we did. The court found Scholl, her brother Hans, and their friend Christoph Probst to be guilty of treason and they were executed later that day. Sophie was 21 years old. Gertrude remained in Berlin with Hitler until the end of the war in 1945 and was responsible for typing Hitler's last private political will and testament on the day before his death. And because of this, she is known as Hitler's last secretary. After being captured by the Soviets and Americans and being interrogated about her role in the end of the Nazi regime, she was freed in 1946 and allowed to live in West Germany. And eventually she died from cancer in Munich in February 2002 at the age of 81. Throughout her life, she was interviewed about her experiences during and after the war a number of times. And in one of these interviews, she said, of course, the horrors of which I heard in connection of the Nuremberg trials shocked me greatly. but." At that time, I could not see any connection between these things and my own past. I was only happy that I had not personally been guilty of any of these things, and that I had not been aware of the scale of these things. One day in Munich, Gertrude walked past a plaque on the wall in memory of Sophie Scholl and learned about her for the first time. She said, I must have often walked past the commemorative plaque to Sophie Scholl without noticing it. One day I did, and I was terribly shocked when I realized that she was executed in 1943, just when I was beginning my own job with Hitler. Sophie Scholl had originally been a BDM member herself, a year younger than me, and she saw clearly that she was dealing with the criminal regime. All of a sudden, I had no excuse anymore. It was no excuse to be young it would have been possible to find things out. So why am I telling you this story? I was reminded of the story of Sophia and Gertrude, the story of two very similar women, one who confronted politics head on and one who ignored it from a tweet that I saw by Al Swiger. If you don't know Al, he's the author of Automate the Boring Thing with Python, Boring Stuff with Python, and, and many other excellent books on Python. And if you do know Al, you know he's also not someone to shy away from politics. So what happened is 
Al got a a direct message on Twitter saying, hey, I followed you. I liked your book and I hope to get more information from you, but I don't like your politics. I don't like what you're talking about. And so I'm going to unfollow you. But I don't mean that in a bad way. I just thought you wanted to know. And, you know, Al responded and he said, I get it. I want to live in a world where I just tweet about Python, make my little video games, don't concern myself with politics, but we don't live in that world. And I feel like I've started seeing this trend where people really want to separate tech from politics or just generally put politics in this tidy little box somewhere where they don't have to think about it. And I get it. Politics isn't really particularly fun. And lately, for some of us, it's been a challenging and potentially traumatizing part of our lives. So like Al, I also want to live in a world where I can just come to you and talk just about Python. But here's the thing. Python doesn't exist in a world without politics. Python is a product of our world and the individuals that created it and of their individual politics. And if you think that Python is a piece of pure technology, completely devoid of politics, you are absolutely wrong. Python is an incredibly powerful piece of technology that was built and maintained for free by a collective of volunteers, distributed for free to anyone entirely without restriction whatsoever. And if that's not political, I don't know what is. And look, it's not just Python. It's, it's everything. We don't live in a world without politics. And what this means is that all technology is inherently political. Sometimes attempting to remove politics is just akin to that DM asking, telling Al that he was going to you know, stop following him. It's like putting your head in the sand, pretending like politics just doesn't affect you and doesn't exist. Kind of like your child young. But sometimes it's an active attempt to suppress legitimate dissent, like what happened to Sophie Scholl. And either way, the act of trying to remove politics is, in and of itself, political. And even inaction is political and even potentially dangerous. So, what is the collective good? Let's take Python as an example. This community exists and is successful because we made it, all of us. Python and everything related to Python exists and is successful because we built it. And I think that we all collectively can agree that it's it's good. Python is pretty great. It's incredibly useful. It might not be perfect, but it's a net good for the world. And it exists because at millions of tiny points in its history, people made the conscious decision to make it good and keep it good and make it something that's good for the world. And the sum of all those decisions were more powerful than anyone that chose otherwise or chose inaction instead. You might not feel personally responsible for the collective good of Python. And that's okay. You might have never written a line of Python, and maybe this is your first Python conference. And to that, I say, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. You might not be a maintainer of a popular package on PyPI. And to that, I say, don't worry. There's plenty of stuff on PyPI. You're probably also not a core developer. And that's okay, too, because I'm not a core developer either. But I fundamentally believe that as a member of this community, and if you're listening to this, I do consider you to be a member of this community. It is your responsibility to protect the collective good. That's that's why Python exists. Some people put some time and effort into it. Sometimes they put more than they got out of it, but usually they didn't, just a little bit. And if you don't know how to do that, don't worry. I'm going to show you how. Sometimes protecting the collective good means doing things that are hard. And I'll give you a small personal example. I'm one of the people primarily responsible for responding to reports of malware on PyPI. And dealing with malware on PyPI is not fun. There's nothing about it that's fun. 
It's incredibly time consuming. It's mostly thankless. It's somewhat demoralizing and it honestly never ends. And yet, I do it anyways. I'm not saying that I'm trophy shul, but my ultimate desire is to make things collectively better. And I think, at least in small part, by doing this hard thing, I have. Sometimes protecting the collective good means not doing things that are easy. And I'll share another example from my personal life. When I finished college, I had a job all lined up with the research lab that I had worked with when I was in grad school. And it would have been so easy for me to continue to work on that path, to keep going, doing the same work, working with the same people on the same projects. But I spent a lot of time thinking about what the total outcome of everything I did would be if I had done that. And what I decided was that morally, it wasn't okay with me because I couldn't see how it would be a benefit to the collective good. I thought that I could do better. And, you know, more or less restarting my career right out of school wasn't easy. But as it turns out, I think I made the right choice and I'm really glad that I did. Protecting the collective good, generally, it just means just doing something. Remember, even inaction has effects, but usually those effects are negative. So as Python developers, as open source users, uh, what can you do? Here's my call to action. And here's the thing about my call to action. I work in software security. Specifically, I work in open source software security. Do you know the phrase, it takes two to tango? What this means is that the only reason my job <clears throat> exists is because there are people out there who want to do harm to open source, to the people that use open source. So most of the things that I think that you should do are going to be related to open source software security. The good thing is, I'm guessing that almost all of you are open source software users. So hopefully most of this is applicable. And there are a couple different ways that I think about threats and things we can do for open source software. There are three wildly different levels of threats to open source software. The first one is by far the most common, trying to steal your monkeys. The NFT and cryptocurrency community is essentially rife with people who are trying to rob you. So when you hear about things like malware on PyPI, removing 3,600 malicious libraries, it's almost definitely an example of this. This includes things like stealing compute to mine cryptocurrency, encrypting file systems, holding them ransom in exchange for cryptocurrency, et cetera. It's usually for financial gain. And these end up being fairly harmless to the average user of the Python community, but they are still potentially harmful. The second is less common. An attacker wants to do you specifically or your organization some harm. And maybe it's financially motivated as well, but maybe not. Maybe it's just to collect a bug bounty, or maybe it's just for the lulls. An example of this is this particular type of supply chain attack, which directly targeted large corporations. The third is the what I'll call low frequency but high impact threat. And these are usually per perpetuated by state actors. This is attacks like solar winds. And I'm assuming that everyone and their mother has heard about solar winds by now, but if you haven't, it was described as the largest and most sophisticated attack ever. And it was called the worst nightmare cyber attack. And this is because it was extremely sophisticated, but also because it directly attacked the U.S. government. And all of these types of threats could really actually affect any of us. I really want you who make up our collective community to be protected against all of these. Everything from protecting your monkeys to protecting your government. Partly because I care about protecting the collective good and partly because it's my job. You see, the SolarWinds attack was almost directly responsible for the creation of the U.S. Executive Order 14028, 
on improving the nation's cybersecurity. So for anyone that's not based in the U.S., I'm assuming most of you are, or for anyone that is based in the U.S. but doesn't know how their government works, an executive order is kind of like an email from your boss that's telling you what to do. This has the effect of setting policy for the entire executive branch and federal government. But it's also kind of like placing an order at a restaurant in the sense that you kind of say what you want to happen, and then people go off and try and figure out what that means and how to make it happen, and maybe that takes a little while. So this executive order was published a little more than a year ago, and we're still at the everyone is trying to figure out how to make it happen stage. And this executive order, it has a number of directives, but it specifically calls out the software supply chain. And if you think for a minute that this is just limited to government entities, remember that the government uses a lot of software. Most governments use a lot of software. They also use a lot of the same software that you and I do, the same open source software. So the terms of this order sort of have a viral effect of improving software security for everyone. And this is generally a good thing. So as a result, a number of organizations, including Google, have stepped up to make improvements here in cybersecurity and in open source software security. And these improvements are not just for Google and they're not just for the US government. They're for the entire ecosystem. And this means that many of my suggestions are going to be a little biased because these are the things that I think are worthwhile improvements and that my team thinks are worthwhile improvements. And also remember, because they're tech, they're inherently political as well. So here's a list of things that I think you today can do to protect the collective good. And most of these are going to seem focused on your personal software security or the way that you consume open source software. And after taking these steps or adopting these tools, depending on what it is, it will likely help protect you and your organization. But you should also consider that any attack against you might be part of some bigger, larger attack against the collective good. And all of these are going to require some effort on your part. None of it's for free, some more than others. But remember, even inaction has effects, and usually those are negative. So the first thing you can do, enable two-factor authentication. Enable it everywhere, but specifically, I want you to enable it on PyPI. You might have heard recently that PyPI was the target of a phishing attack. And in that attack, some users' accounts, which were not protected with two-factor authentication, were compromised. For users with two-factor authentication enabled, especially those that use security keys, they were unaffected. But additionally, PyPI users may also be vulnerable to other types of similar attacks, like credential stuffing, due to password reuse, password breaches, or leaked credentials. And all of these are classes of threats that two-factor authentication effectively protects against. Seriously, if you do one thing after this talk is over, go and enable two-factor authentication on PyPI if you have an account. Go to pypi.org slash 2FA. Even if you don't maintain any projects there, if there's even a slight chance that you will in the future, go and do it. Not only will you protect your current and future users as well as yourself, but you'll also save us, the PyPI team, from having to deal with your potential future compromise of your account if you were ever fished or your password was stolen or anything like that. As a bonus, Right now, if you're the maintainer of a critical project, and by critical project, we define that to be the top 1% of projects on PyPI by download counts, we are giving away 4,000 Google Titan security keys for free to maintainers of critical projects to help them enable two-factor authentication with hardware keys. Now, unfortunately, these aren't available in every region, but generally, we want to make them as available as possible to all PyPI maintainers of critical projects. You can go to pypi.org slash security key giveaway to read more about this. 
and to check and see if you're eligible and if you're able to receive the key. And these will be there till October 1st. Our goal is to try and get all IPI maintainers of critical projects to be using two-factor authentication with security keys in the near future. The second thing that you can do is be aware of known vulnerabilities, because the reality is humans are humans, bugs are going to get written, and they will be discovered. You should be immediately aware of the presence of known vulnerabilities in your applications, in your environments, your libraries, whatever. And you should be able to quickly remediate, quickly fix the presence of those vulnerabilities if they exist. So how does this help the collective good? If your software is vulnerable and an attacker knows about it, but you don't know about it, you or your users might become a target. And this has potentially far-reaching effects, potentially beyond your own software. For example, if your software is a dependency for something more widely used and it has a vulnerability, that could potentially be used to compromise the bigger project that was depending on you. So there are two things in the Python community that will help make you aware of known vulnerabilities. The first is the Python Packaging Authority has created a centralized ecosystem-specific public repository for security advisories. And the goal here is to make it easier to report, but more importantly, discover security advisories. So these exist for most major ecosystems, and the Python one was created recently. These use a format called the Open Source Vulnerability Format, and this is provided by the Open Source Vulnerabilities Project. Um, OSV also has an API, and they act as a vendor-neutral aggregator and mediator for vulnerabilities. They kind of look like this. Here's an example. This is an advisory for Django of a vulnerability that was introduced, found, and fixed. Um, but you're not, you're not supposed to read these each of these by hand, right? The idea here is that these are machine-readable. And the, what, the reason we want them to be machine readable is because we also have vulnerability auditing software. So software that is able to audit and discover known vulnerabilities isn't something that's specifically new. Similar software to this has existed before. What's actually new here is that these tools are now community-owned tools, and they use the advisory databases that we previously mentioned, and they're free. So in the last year, I helped create and release a tool called PIP Audit, uh, which is a third-party tool. And you can run this locally, run it as part of your release process in your integration tests, wherever. You can run it inside of a container against a requirements.txt file. And what it will do is it will tell you if there are any known vulnerabilities present in the software that would exist or does exist there. So this allows you to feel confident that you're not about to deploy something or release something with a known vulnerability. To be clear, it's never going to find a vulnerability that nobody knows about. But the goal is that there are vulnerabilities out there in the software that we use that are present in certain versions and usually they get fixed and we should be able to upgrade to those fixed versions. So the way you use PIP audit, you can run it against a local environment. You could install this now and just run it on your machine, see what vulnerabilities exist there. Um, but you can also audit a requirements file. You can run it against something that you're about to install. And when you run it, it tells you if there is a known vulnerability, its ID, and what version it's fixed. But it makes it even easier than that for you because you can call PIP audit fix, and it will automatically upgrade you to a non-vulnerable fixed version. This is really nice, and I'd love for folks to try this out and give us feedback. A third thing that you can do to protect the collective good, but more importantly, protect yourself, is enforce security policies for your source control. So as developers, we're writing code, we're putting it in things like GitHub, GitLab, various source control mediums. And you know there are policies and things we can do to secure these repositories above and beyond what the source of control repository provides itself. This will allow you to reduce the surface area for ways in which your source repository could be compromised. This is even before you go to distribute or release software. So the tool I recommend for this is All-Star App. This is a project of the Open Source uh, Software Security Foundation, um, and it's a GitHub application. You can go to github.com apps 
Allstar dash app. So Allstar is a, a GitHub app and it enforces best practices. It also allows you to set a policy so you don't have to adopt all those practices at once. And it lets you set this policy across an entire organization. So these could be things like requiring branch protection to be enabled, preventing binaries from being checked into source control, preventing the existence of outside collaborators, um, ensuring that fuzzing is enabled, and that kind of thing. So when what it does is when it finds an exception, it, it automatically creates a, an issue in the repository. So for example, um, here's the repository that I maintained, and uh, the repository had violated a policy that was set by the organization, and it created this issue saying um, there were outside collaborators that had admin access. So the org had set this policy, and when the repo was in violation of the policy, we were immediately made aware of it. This is pretty nice, and again, I'd love folks to, to install this and try it out on their source control. It works uh, right now with, with GitHub, and it works pretty nicely. Fourth thing I'd love for everyone to do is use security scorecards for their open source projects. So security scorecards, they, this is a project to assess open source projects for security risks through a series of, of automated checks. So you could use it proactively to assess and make decisions about your own code base. So you could run this uh, you know, against your code base, but you can also use it to evaluate other projects and dependencies um, and potentially even work with the maintainers of those projects and dependencies to improve their code bases that you might want to integrate against. Um, the way security scorecards works is it gives you a score. So here's an example for uh, GVisor, which this is a Google project, um, and scorecard was run against this project, and it sort of, against a double, couple different criteria, it determined uh, sort of the score, how well the, the project has aligned with these best practices. Um, so these are things like whether it's doing vulnerability uh, or whether it has any known vulnerabilities, um, whether it has a license, security policy, um, it has enabled fuzzing, that kind of thing. Things like pin dependencies, for example, here uh, aren't present in the repository, so it, it got a poor score for that. But this essentially gives you an easy metric to determine what places your uh, open source project can be improved. But also, as a consumer of open source, you can use this to evaluate potentially how secure a dependency that you're thinking about adopting is, right? Um, these scores aren't perfect, but generally a lower score here might be an indicator of a project that's not as actively maintained or not adequately protected against uh, open source attacks. And you can see security scorecards uh, at securityscorecards.dev. Um, and if you want to adopt this for your own project, uh, they run in CI with a GitHub action against your project to, to give you a score, and you can put a nice little badge in your readme as well. The fifth thing I think everyone can do, and at least be aware of, uh, is signing things with SigStore. So signing generally helps ensure uh, integrity as a, a, an artifact, like a software a piece of software or a file or really anything move from one place to another uh, as they are published, as they're redistributed, and so on. So historically, when people say signing, they usually mean using GPG. And that technology has been around for forever. It's been around for a very long time. You probably don't use it a lot, though. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. SigStore is a, a new project by the Linux Foundation in partnership with the Open Source Software Security Foundation um, and across multiple vendors, including Google, Red Hat, and many others. SigStore is a, a new way to think about signatures, identities, and trust. And I, I could do an entire talk on SigStore and how it works alone because it, it's really novel and it's really interesting. The short version is that Sixdoor is much easier to use than GPG. If you've ever used GPG before, you know that the user experience is not great. But also Sixdoor is not just about cryptographic signing. Um, GPG requires humans essentially to not be humans because one of the things that GPG requires is for users to maintain private keys. And humans have a tendency to lose things. 
someone once said to me, GPT would work really well if you could also go around and permanently staple everyone's private key to their foreheads. But you can't do that. But with Sigstore, it's much easier to establish this trust in individual identities, and there's no need to maintain or keep hold of private keys, which is the common problem with GPG. Fixer also integrates really well with existing cloud platforms and CIDC, CI systems um, via the OAuth protocol, which it uses under the hood to establish identity and trust. You can read more about Sigstore at sigstore.dev, but there's more. To make Sigstore really easy to use for Python users, we have built a native Python client for signing and verifying signatures. This is essentially a Sigstore client entirely built in Python that you can pip install. And this includes really nice features, uh, including detecting ambient credentials. And what this means is if you try to sign something in an environment that supports the appropriate identity, it will use that automatically. And what this means is if you sign in an environment like GitHub Actions, um, some Google Cloud virtual machines, that kind of thing, it will automatically adopt that identity and sign with it without you actually needing to think about it. And the potential for signing things with these sort of micro identities, the identity of the system that built the software is really powerful uh, once, once you unlock that. Sixer is not quite feature complete yet. You can try it and use it, it will work fine. Um, but we are working towards this 1.0 release eventually. And I'm really super excited. I wanna give everyone uh, a sneak peek of something that I don't think has really been announced yet. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna be signing the, the CPython releases with Sigstore going forward. The upcoming CPython 3.11 release uh, will be signed by the release managers with Sigstore in addition to the existing GPG signatures. I've been working on this for a super long time, and it's really amazing to see uh, this actually coming together. We'll be signing the uh, release candidate that happens on Monday, and then in October, when the final release is made, that will be signed as well. Here's a fully detailed explanation of how uh, users will verify six for signatures with CPython uh, using the six or library that is on PyPI. You can go to python.org slash download slash six store um, to read that and stay tuned for some more details there. Back to the collective good. The sixth thing that I think everyone can do, and probably something that you're already doing, is just be a user. This means you. This means try this stuff out and then tell us how it works for you. Share your experience. Tell us what it's like to be a user. Possibly, you know, even become a, a contributor if you want. If this is all open source stuff, um, generally just participate in the ecosystem. And the seventh and last thing I want to ask you all to do, just generally and broadly, is take open source security seriously. It might take some investment of your time and energy. I don't think any of the things I described come for free. We try to make them as easy as possible. Um, but yeah, they do will take some small investment. But I promise you that it's worth it to protect the collective good. Remember, this is why something like Python exists. Some people put a little time and effort into it. Sometimes it's more than they got out of it, but usually it's not to make it better. This is the end of my talk, but before I end, I want to say thank you to a few folks. Um, first, I want to say thanks to you all for listening to my talk. Um, thank you to the PyCon APAC organizers for inviting me to speak, uh, and also for putting in a ton of work into what I'm sure will be a really amazing conference. Um, thank you to the PyCon Taiwan organizers as well for acting as host for the event this year. Uh, this is not my first uh, time I've spoken at your conferences. So I was at PyCon JP in 2019. Um, do you know PyCon Japan? And I also spoke at PyCon Taiwan in 2019. And this remains to be the only conference I've ever been at with a string ensemble. Both of these are among my favorite Python conferences and communities that I've seen and experienced. You, here's my wish. You all have amazing 
countries, culture, and community, there is collective good there. I want to say that my wish is that I could be there in person this year, but I really admire that your primary concern is keeping everyone safe. Thank you for that. If the pandemic has taught me anything, it's that we, we really don't know what the future will bring, but keeping each other safe, keeping our community together, and protecting the collective good is of the utmost importance. So instead, my wish is that we can all be together again at some point in the future, and I wish you all the best in everything necessary to make that wish a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin, for your your interesting share. And he, now we are in the QA session, so I'm going to ask questions from our audience. And the first question is from Tai. Um, he asks, "I follow the Pi Pi Fishing News. We appreciate you and you and the team ever for handling this. And how?" Many average hours did you actually sleep during the event? <laughs> How many did I sleep? Is that the question? <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah. it. I think that this uh, project will really consume a lot of your time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So first, uh, thanks for thanking me. It, it's it's uh, it's great to hear that feedback. That it's appreciated the work that we do. Um, and yeah, thanks for also understanding that, yeah, it's an investment in time. So, um, the phishing attack itself, probably, you know, it, it didn't cost me sleep. Um, we woke, kind of woke up to it and had it under control pretty quickly and were able to determine what had happened and were able to monitor and keep an eye on some stuff. Like I said, some users were compromised and as a result of that, some, um, releases of legitimate projects were made with uh, illegitimate releases with, with malware included in them. And so we were able to discover that and, and take those down, and, and that did take some time. Honestly, the, the thing that took the most time in those kinds of responses and the thing we're, we're still kind of addressing is, is the community feedback, making sure that everyone's aware, making sure that we have adequate communication with the community, um, that people know what's happening, because uh, and, and sort of just responding. You know, We sort of have this incredible flood of people that are telling us that this is happening, and uh, it's great to get that many reports and have people you know, really care about IPI uh, and the community and then want to you know, look out. But and we also have to say, OK, yes, <laughs> God, we got it. We heard about it. We're working on it. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, all, all of these things, you know, the, the, the maintenance of, of IPI is shared by a couple of folks and uh, it's generally a lot of work and, and none of us are really ever full time working on it. But sometimes some days it's. Uh, we drop everything else and that's what we do. And, and this was one of those days. Yeah. Thanks, Ty, for the question. Yeah. Thank you, your efforts on this project. <laughs> and thanks. the next question from Junwei is um, what are the most common malware and threats on PyPy? Are there any malware detection mechanisms now? If people want to help contribute, where should they start? This is a really great question. Uh, so. Yeah, what's the most common thing? Are there detection mechanisms and, and how can people help? So uh, what happens the most is sort of that, that number one you know, threat that I was talking about, which is sort of not super harmful to most PyPI users. And that's um, what I'll call exfiltration. But generally, this is someone trying to gain access to some credentials that might happen. And, and usually these credentials are uh, for some reason, Discord tokens. Uh, there's a lot of malware on PyPI trying to compromise Discord users. And, and the, the reason, I, I do kind of know the reason for this. The reason is because a lot of uh, cryptocurrency and NFT projects, they use Discord. And so if you are able to compromise, you know, potential like an administrator in one of those communities, um, you could potentially like convince other people to give you something that you think is valuable. So um, that is like, you know, we remove a lot of malware from PyPI. Um, that is probably the most common thing is like people trying to compromise Discord users. Um, I, I don't think that, that those attacks are very successful. Like they sort of hinge on the fact that someone 
trick someone else into accidentally pip installing something that does something bad. And, you know, when we look at download counts for these, they're not very significant. So um, that those aren't, I, I guess those aren't the high impact events that we really care about, but they do take up a fair amount of our time. Um, the way that we find out about these is that um, PyPI itself, and there was just a, a blog post published about this recently, actually, but PyPI itself, we don't, we don't scan anything that's published to PyPI. We basically allow anyone to upload whatever they want as long as it sort of conforms to the file formats that we require. Uh, so that means that like it's it's totally possible to write something malicious and publish it to PyPI and no one's going to stop you. Um, what happens, though, is that once you publish it, there is a huge community of security researchers, um, some of them working for nonprofits. Like I mentioned, the Open Source Software Security Foundation, they have a team that does um, you know, package analysis, and they send us reports. But some are like for-profit companies that do uh, security uh, investigations, malware detection, that kind of thing. Um, and they all are great contributors to PyPI in that they tell us as soon as they find something that's malware, uh, and and they report it to us immediately. So, um, and it's great because they also sort of complement each other. Some of them are really good at detecting certain things, and some of them are better at detecting others. And, um, you know, there's some overlap as well, but usually they do a really good job of, of finding and, um, and telling us when there's malware. And, you know, w- one of the problems with dealing with those kind of things is the potential for a false positive, right? We, we never want to take down a project that is legitimate. So it's really important to us to um, always have a human review and make sure that something is actually worth taking down that's malicious um, before it happens because we we don't want to you know mess up someone's actual project and and potentially all the users of that project as well um, so yeah that's that's sort of how we find these discoveries and then the last question I really love which is how you can help um, so one of the things that is helpful is you know if you find something on PyPI that you think is seems a little weird uh, let us know so if you go to pipi.org slash security we have a whole list of guidelines for how you can <clears throat> report these things to us. And it's essentially you send us an email and, and we follow up on it. Um, that's super helpful. That's how all these security researchers let us know about malware and let us respond to it effectively. Um, there are other things that you can help as well, right? So this this sort of like process of, of parsing through all these reports and taking down things that are malicious, um, this is the thing that is something that's hard to ask of volunteers and also something that is hard to give people a responsibility to do because it's essentially giving you the ability to delete anything from PyPI. So unless, you know, I, as a maintainer, have a lot of trust in you, I'm not going to necessarily let you do that. So the way that you could actually help here is if you wanted to start building trust in yourself as a moderator, as a you know, contributor to PyPI, um, start contributing just, you know, in the repository of source stuff and do it consistently um, and eventually, you know, that helps us because it takes that stuff off our plate and we can focus on higher profile things. But eventually over time also, we can trust you more and entrust you with more and more um, you know, responsibilities. So if you're interested in getting involved in, in PyPI or any of the other projects mentioned for that matter, um, please reach out to me. I would very much like to help you introduce you to one of the maintainers or uh, help you figure out how to become a contributor. But thanks for that question. And the next question from an anonymous uh, audience, he asked that uh, are there plans to enable additional shipping options for the hardware keys? Yeah, so I'm really sorry to say that it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to distribute those keys to other countries. And uh, I'll explain why. <clears throat> so right now, I think it's limited to uh, 12 different countries, and they're probably the ones that you can imagine they're available in. Um, the reason for this is because we, you know, the, the Python Software Foundation and the PyPI team, um, we're limited by the places where Google sells those keys. Because the way that the giveaway works is we give you a discount code and you go and redeem it. And then those keys are shipped directly to you. We never see them or touch them or anything like that. Um, but unfortunately, that means that only the countries that Google has, you know, gotten clearance to sell these keys are the ones that are available. And you know, I, I am not a lawyer. I don't work in like import export, but um, there are some like legal reasons why we can only 
you know, Google can only distribute those keys in certain countries. We did try to talk to some other key manufacturers who are able to distribute in other countries their security keys. Um, they weren't able to, you know, sort of provide the same contribution that we needed in order to give their keys away instead of the Titan keys. We would have really loved to do that, um, but it, it just didn't happen. So it's something that we still want to do, and, and maybe in the future, if uh, any of these other manufacturers want to distribute keys, um, reach out. Let me know. We'll try and figure something out. But yeah, for now, unfortunately, those are uh, only available in, in those those regions where they're at right now. Okay, and. Uh... Next question. I think next is not a question. You just said a uh, sneak peek the best. Can wait for the release. <laughs> and I think me too. So, oh, I, so yeah. What was that? The the C Python release? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, C Python 3.11 is going to be really exciting for like lots and lots of reasons. Um, I've seen folks working very hard on it lately. Um, I don't, I don't work on core Python stuff. So, you know, I'm just a regular Python user basically. Um, but it is, it's been exciting for me to participate in sort of like figuring out the Python release story and ways that we can improve it. And like the first thing we're doing here is, is signing it with six store. Um, but there'll be more stuff as well that we do to make, you know, uh, a lot more assurances about the security of, of C Python in the future. Uh, it's not something that, you know, is really a problem right now. I think people aren't really thinking about it. You know, CPython hasn't been compromised, but there's always potential there. And it's good to know that, like, we have safeguards in place to you know, keep that very important piece of software uh, secure. Okay. Yeah. And the next question and is also asked by Tai, and he asks, will sponsor PyPay be our GitHub or something? Help the PyPy to us an individual. Uh, I love that Ty is asking all these questions. Thank you, Ty. That was the question: like, is it possible to sponsor PyPI as an individual? Mm, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so like on GitHub, uh, PyPI. Actually, we recently moved to a separate organization, a, a PyPI organization. But if you go to github.com slash PYPA, the Python Package Authority. Um, you can sponsor the Python Package Authority right now on GitHub. We, we're on GitHub sponsors. Um, you can do that. Another way that you can fund um, Python packaging specifically is through Tidelift. So if your organization um, uh, you know, wants to become a Tidelift subscriber and you use some of these packages, some of that revenue will get redirected into the maintainers and, and the Python Packaging Authority for those projects. Um, and then the, the other thing, and like, honestly, this is the way you know, we, we, we do always appreciate individual donations, but a lot of the things that need done to PyPI, the work that needs done is big and time consuming and it requires like a, a focused full time effort. So we've had a lot of success in the past about um, finding grants or finding organizations that want to sponsor or pay for very specific work, specific features, specific improvements, that kind of thing. Uh, we've done this a, a bunch of times. And in fact, like the fact that IPI itself supports two-factor authentication, that was an example of someone. Uh, we, we found a, a funder. They funded the project. We hired contractors that came. They built it. IPI now has that feature. It was a great success. Um, so I'd say like, you know, we, we always appreciate individual contributions. But um, the way that we really can affect change with IPI is, is trying to find ways to fund these big projects, find ways to get organizations to uh, sponsor the Python Software Foundation, sponsor PyPI individually, um, all those kind of things. But yeah, that's a great question. And and a and, uh, quick question from me. Um, yep. I think uh, I have a question then. Have you have any experience when uh, you build your Python project by some uh, vulnerable uh, packages that makes your project being attacked or me uh, or me some problem when yeah uh, having those uh, vulnerable vulnerable Python packages and how would you deal with it? Yeah, I, I so you know it, well this is the problem. Last time I was on the Talk Python podcast, and I told if you listen to the podcast. I, the host is Michael Kennedy, and I was on it a couple of weeks ago, and I told Michael. I, we were talking about phishing and I said, I've never seen a phishing attack. And then uh, weeks later there was a phishing attack. So 
I don't want to say that this has never happened. Like, I'm not aware of it. It might have happened uh, that like build tooling or you know core Python was compromised in some way, and it's it's reasonable to think that it might have happened because um, you know when I, I talked about the Solar Winds attack before, the the way that that piece of software was compromised was not um, you know someone committing malicious source code, not someone accidentally writing a bug. Um, it wasn't like someone middlemanning them or anything like that. What happened was some of the, the build tooling and sort of release tooling software that they used was, was in effect compromised and they were able to replace uh, what was being distributed with something else. So um, it is like, it's a valid threat. And there are, um, I didn't go into a lot of detail about uh, Salsa, but Salsa is a, a framework that you know a lot of organizations are working with and working on right now, including Google. And it's a way to sort of describe how secure this build pipeline is. And right now, like essentially everyone's at Salsa zero, right? We're kind of just installing whatever and building whatever and sort of hoping and trusting that it works. But there's extra stuff that we can do to have more confidence in the integrity of the software we're building. Um, these things are hard to detect. And these things are also, uh, you know, potentially pretty bad. So I think like we sort of determined the best possible solution here is to just uh, you know, increase the controls and security of the build process and ensure that when software is being built, it's not being compromised. But um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe the, the next question I want to ask is, uh, is there a very unforgettable project or a story when you are uh, contributing in this uh, project. Yeah. Can you share share with us more about that? Yeah. Well, I, I'll I'll say that like one of the I, I mentioned a lot of like hard stuff that I do as a pipeline moderator and administrator, but there are some fun things as well. And um, one of the fun things is just sort of seeing <laughs> all of the the people publish really funny stuff on PyPI sometimes. Some really interesting projects, uh, some really fun stuff. Um, I don't. I don't have something specific that comes to mind, but uh, yeah, I mean, all the time I'll be doing just some like very routine thing and come across somebody's project that you know maybe is not super used, but is super interesting, has a really funny description, uh, and I really love I, those are like little gems, and we I always we always share those uh, in our you know chat channel um, when we find them because they're, they're always uh, really fun to see. So I think it's about at the end of this session. And thank you, Dustin, for your informative and interesting sharing. And the audience, you, if uh, the audience which we who want to uh, discuss or interact with Dustin, you can go to the uh, space, the Gather Town Space A, the the main. Uh, the center part of the space A. And if you don't know where to join, you can go to a chat box and search search me, uh, Jiahua, and you can you can follow me and you can see all the people here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. It's great to be here. And like I said, I hope to be with you all again soon. Okay. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you.